This is fitting if you were here last week. <laughs> we did a, a message on Yom Kippur. The atonement that we're just experiencing something of around this communion table. And um, we did the whole message, but we didn't get the full PowerPoint because my computer very conveniently did an, up, uh, an update and right in the middle of it. And I couldn't stop it. <laughs> Are you looking for something? What, what did you need? Oh, later. Glory to God. There's still a hush in the house, isn't there? Wow. <laughs> God bless you. Welcome to church. Today, we're bringing an offering. And we're bringing an offering to the house that is our tabernacle's offering. I'm just very quickly going to, while we receive the offering, um, I'm going to run briefly. It, it, all, it, 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 all, it is all in the house. So it really just, if you brought an offering, whether it's your tithe or whether it's your offering or whether it's both, lay it before the Lord now. And we're mindful of the fact that God says in his word to his people Israel not to come empty-handed to him three times in the year being Passover, being Pentecost, and being tabernacles. And, and, and God doesn't lay a condition without a reward. God doesn't, doesn't give us something to do without giving us something that he wants to bless too. So... It's an opportunity. And, and I've heard this said. I've heard televangelists talk about the wonderful blessing that's going to be bestowed on your life for the rest of the year if you do this. And doesn't that sound like a sales pitch? You wanted to be here last week, didn't you? But you're here today, Naomi. God bless you, dear. You know... All I can tell you about that is I think the first year Vicky Ann and I were in Fiji the first year that we deliberately and with knowledge at that time because we had no knowledge of it prior that first year that with knowledge we actually came before the Lord with an offering that we dedicated as a Passover offering and a and a Pentecost offering and a, and, a, and a Tabernacles offering, we saw amazing things happen in our lives for the following year. That's all I can tell you. But let me say this, that God, a God of love and mercy, is looking for every opportunity to bestow blessing on his children and on his house. And um, I'm just very quickly going to cover off on the, so that you can see the whole PowerPoint this week. Um, we'll just very quickly go through Yom Kippur. Again, we understood Yom Kippur, by the way, the Day of Atonement. Uh, the Lord said that on, the, on the, the tenth day of the seventh month, that coincided with Wednesday, a week gone by, was Yom Kippur. And, and so um, then the... the uh, uh, the beginning of tabernacles commenced four days later on the Sunday. And so tabernacles, that feast, Sukkot, where they build the, the, the temporary little booths and dwelling places, is going to come to a conclusion tomorrow. So this Yom Kippur, to remain as a statute forever, says the Lord, in Leviticus 16.29, on the seventh day of the month, the tenth day of the month, you sh uh, the, on the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and shall do no kind of work. The native born or the stranger who lives as a foreigner among you. Have we, we should actually let the bag come around. Just as I flick through the PowerPoint for you. 
We understand that Jesus perfectly fulfilled this day uh, when he died for our sins. Biblically speaking, it is the holiest day of the year, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And in Israel, uh, in, in their community, they will all be on the day of Yom Kippur attending synagogue, which is what happened in 67 when they were attacked. They were all attending synagogue and left their defense lines down. They've never done that again from that day to this. So why they go to the synagogue? For their prayer. And uh, they, they do inflict themselves. I think there is something of religion in this, but there is something that could be good for the soul too. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, a fallen, solemn fast day. On Yom, Yom Kippur, for nearly 26 hours, they afflict their souls in the following five ways. They don't eat or drink. They don't wash. They don't use lotions or perfumes. Uh, they don't wear leather footwear. And they abstain from relations, that is the marital relations. On this most holy day, the day of abstinence and affliction, while they observe all these, uh, these uh, 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 religious observances afflicting their souls, it is a day that is characterized with a sense of peace. They have a confidence in their relationship with God and uh, his provision for atonement, which means forgiveness and which means that he sets the nation's sins away for the year and he forgets. What you can't read in the black there is Jewish men at the Wailing Wall. They are praying for forgiveness and there is something of that sense that before you put your, bring your sacrifice to the altar, if you have aught against any man, go and be at peace with that person. These men are in an embrace of repentance. They are in an embrace of forgiveness. The love of God is, uh, is, is certainly um, seen on the day of Yom Kippur. Before sunsets, the Jewish people gather in their synagogues. They hear the cantor and they recite their vows and their penitential prayers. And uh, the next morning, they return to their synagogues for morning prayer. Uh, there will be uh, in which uh, several sections of the Torah portion are read. In fact, they read the entire book of Jonah um, in the afternoon service. And Jonah, we understand, is the man who was running away from God's purpose, who was running away from God's call, but he couldn't run. God apprehended him. God kept him on mission. And uh, that there is a sense of Yom Kippur and, and forgiveness that God embraces us and will keep us on track because he is a God who forgives our sins. White linen is worn on Yom Kippur. Uh, we understand that white linen, it was the plain cloth garment that was adorned, that was, uh, that was, uh, that the, the, that the high priest put on instead of the colorful vesture with the ephod and the what have you and this colorful robes. He just, he just donned a very plain linen to go into the most holy of holies for the only day in the year. And um, the high priest would not wear his usual golden garments, as it says. The white linen clothing to them represented purity and humility. Uh, the benefits, uh, which benefits this most sacred of all days. Many Jews uh, and many Jewish men wear what they call a kittel. I don't know if you can read that, a white robe-like garment uh, for evening prayers on Yom Kippur. It is also worn on the wedding day. 
And we understand in Revelations, it, it, it talks about being robed in white so that it is, it is certainly something that, that is um, related to righteousness. Uh, however, we did just mention last week, think about the fact that linen is what was used to wrap the dead and no other material. So it's interesting that Jesus was wrapped in linen and when he rose, he rose through that linen and he left a burnt image of his face. What do we call that today? A still a sacred cloth that I don't even know where it is, the, the, the Shroud of Turin. So that in that linen, we understand that we could associate that, that, that there comes death, but out of that death, we rise to a new life and it's because of the reality of Yom Kippur and the atonement and the forgiveness of our sin and the breaking of our sin nature which is the reality of the new covenant at nightfall as Yom Kippur ends uh, with the blowing of the shofar I did that, didn't I? <laughs> I should blow it again. The people returned home to enjoy their festive meal. They were the breaking fast, remember? And many begin to build their sukkah for the holiday of Sukkot that approaches. By the way, we should mention the scapegoat. The scapegoat which is, 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 is part of what happens on Yom Kippur is that two goats are chosen and one is killed. You wouldn't want to be that goat. I wouldn't want to be the other goat either. <laughs> the goat that they, they impute all the sins, impart all the sins, pray all the sins on that goat and send it out into the wilderness. And... Uh, they got, they got smart eventually. They actually used to send somebody out with that goat to make sure that it didn't come back <laughs> because that goat just had a way of turning up at its, at, its, at its dad's door. Whichever house it came from, here it is. All the sins have been, have been put on this goat and, it, and the silly goat would turn up at home again, looking for a meal. That's it. <laughs> And the thing is that, that what is true is that, and that the, 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 the Israelites believed that there was a curse on that creature. They didn't want it there. So, so they made sure that when it went into, a, into the wilderness place, they would send it out somewhere into a high mountain and somebody would follow that goat and made sure that it fell to its death. Are you getting the picture of Jesus in the, in, when, when they drove him to the edge of the cliff? That was a picture of exactly that. That, that was a picture of, of the, the one who would carry the sin of the world. But he escaped at that time, as you know. So what does this say about the scapegoat? The entire removal of sin. Just everything that I've just told you. But this is the one. Jesus Christ he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities the punishment that brought us peace was laid on him and by his wounds we are healed the true meaning of Yom Kippur the true price of atonement a price that we did not have to pay Thank you, Lord. You got to see the whole PowerPoint. <laughs> right, I'll leave it there. That's okay. We're going to come around our message for today. And uh, I'm mount mindful of the time today. I'm keeping an eye on the time. Um, we are returning to Revelations. And uh, I think... I've lost track of what we're doing. A couple of weeks ago, we introduced this subject and we, we, we just covered off very quickly on the fact that we would be talking 
about the four horsemen. In Revelations chapter 6, we read where, where John tells us how he sees in heaven that Jesus Christ begins to open these seals. And as there is an eruption in heaven or something, you know, there's, there's, there's sounds of thunder and things happen as those seals begin to be released. And the four seals that we're going to talk about. Uh, yeah. The four seals that we're talking about um, are the four horses that are, are released under those seals. Just as we do, before we begin, I, I, I want to remind us that Jesus himself says of Revelations, blessed is he who hears the words of this revelation. Blessed is he who reads the words of of this revelation and blessed is he who keeps the words of this revelation and I, I believe that we as individuals as much as we as a church have entered into a place where the blessing of God is beginning to manifest in different ways in our lives and has been like that I think we could probably all give accounts if you thought about it I know I can of the church ever since we have begun our study in the book of Revelations. So the white horse that's released, that horse is a dictator, or the horseman is a dictator. He is a, he, he is a, a, a character that will, that will act out without thought, for any single person or any single group of people. He is a man who will come as a dictator. He is a man who will come as a deceiver. That is the white horseman. The red horse is, is that horse which is released and empowered to, to break the peace uh, in all the earth. War will be released uh, and, and I believe, as, as, as we did discuss earlier on uh, in this study, that these seals have been open for some time. In fact, I believe, if you remember what we talked about, the timing of these seals, that when Jesus returns to heaven, after his death, after his resurrection, and perhaps at his ascension, there is a suggestion in the chronology of, of Scripture that that is when the seals were opened, some almost 2,000 years ago. But these realities, the forces that are released through the, through the opening of these seals are just galloping to a place of fulfillment, coming to a place of increase and coming to a place of finality, perhaps even in our own times. The black horse is that horse where the rider appears with scales and it is the horse that is talking about famine and desolation. And we know that we have seen famines. We know that we have seen economic ruin. We know that we have seen drought. But I believe there is coming a, a time in, in the final fulfillment of what the opening of that seal means where people will not be able to find groceries on shop shelves. People will not be able to live in the comfort of their own home. You won't be able to just go and put a light switch on and have a hot shower. I believe those days ultimately are coming when the fullness of the black horse is fulfilled. The pale horse is that the horse of death. We're going to go back to the white horse in a moment, but if you were here, we understood that, that the, uh, the Greek word for the pale horse is actually chloros, which means green. And, um, and there was a thought that perhaps uh, 
pale was used because the color of death is pale. And then eventually as the, as the flesh begins to, to break down, it turns green. And, and, and so maybe the, the translators felt to use that word, but in actual fact, chloros in the Greek means green. The CIA fact sheet today will tell you, though, that green is the color of Islam. That's interesting because the Bible mentions that this pale horse is given power to bring death over a fourth, a quarter, 0.25, 25%, one in four in the whole earth. Here's another little fact for you. Who can tell me how, what the size of the population of, on the globe is today? I understand that it is somewhere between six and perhaps seven billion people on planet Earth today. Can you imagine one in four? We're talking about at least one and a half billion people dying under the purge of that black horse. Here's another little fact for you. Did you know that Islam today statistically has a quarter of the earth's population? Now, I'm not saying we're going to kill everybody that's under Islam. But in terms of the portion given power over a quarter of the earth, think about that. Is there any mistake in the fact that Islam actually holds power over a quarter of the earth just in the numbers? I heard somebody say, and we know that they are, they are not all extremists, but probably about 30% of Muslims could be extreme because they actually believe in their Quran. They actually believe. And if they are sufficiently motivated, would act out what they believe. Now, if that's true, there's something like 500 million Muslims out there that are getting ready to take somebody's head off. Uh, I want to say this about Revelation. It's not a horror story. We understand that apocalypse, we, we immediately associate that word with disaster and with destruction. But we know that apocalypse means uncovering. It means unveiling. It means that God is uncovering the truth for us to understand and for us to see. So that the, the church in this hour can be empowered with knowledge that we can actually become the light on the hill. We can actually become the one that can bring the good news. We can actually offer an answer. We can actually give people a way out of what we know is definitely coming. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. So the world system today we see is, is, is full of a government, governments that are part of this world system, this fallen system, uh, politicians rivaling for the high seat, and uh, by and large, most of all, most of them, they're just part of that, that, that wicked system. They are vying and fighting for a position in an evil system. And, and, and we see the world over the results of legislation and, and politics that, that is, is, is not really looking to enhance or build or promote. It certainly is not looking to enhance or build or, and promote the things of God. We're actually seeing um, in, in our schools less and less. I mean, I don't know what all the facts are here in Australia, but I, I remember when I went to school as a young man, we would pray openly in the assembly area. We would honor God publicly. We, we used to have our religious studies, and I mean, I was born and raised as a Catholic. We, we had our catechism. I know we didn't openly read the Bible the way we should. 
that's Catholicism. But you know what? We still honoured God. There are many schools now, and I think many systems in place, where, uh, you know, I mean, under this hate legislation where you can't do that because you, you can be taken for, 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 for discriminating against someone else's belief. The amazing thing is they're not seeing that they're discriminating against Christians. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? So evil politicians vying... I don't want to mention too much about politics. There's somebody that's going to say, oh... But, you know, I believe in same-sex marriage. <laughs> you know, I want to say this, and I say it tastefully. I don't think there's anybody here that this applies to. I've actually got one of my own family members, close family members, who, who um, is on the other side of the tracks. And, and they feel so much condemnation... Because, because I'm a, probably because I'm a pastor and a man of God and they don't need to because I love them dearly and do you know what I don't judge them one little bit and my love for them is not altered one iota but I so wish that they could be free of that bondage and that deception when, when governments begin to legislate to give us a, a level playing field with all that kind of nonsense. The nations under that government and under that governance and under that type of government is getting ready for judgment. We're lining up in these end days with the end times with the picture that is being portrayed in Revelations. You know, God ultimately... He says that I will, I, I will not always strive with man. The Bible talks about a time when God would, would sort of wink at, 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 at men's transgression. And that doesn't mean that he was giving it the, uh, the approval. It just means that he was shutting his eyes to it. That's what it means. It means that rather than acting in, in, in dreadful judgment at that moment, he allowed a space for mercy. He allowed a space for repentance. He allowed a space for change. And, and, and right now, God is allowing a space for mercy. God is allowing a space for repentance. And he's allowing a space for change. But God is not a vengeful God, but he is a just God. And, uh, and Jesus Christ is coming back to be a just God and a God of justice. He is coming to put into order the house. He is coming to put into place governments. He's coming to, he's coming to bring correction where correction needs to be brought. That day is coming. Can you give me examples of where we have seen this in the past? We don't need to look much further than Noah's Ark. If we think that God is a God, have I, I've heard somebody stand right here not so long ago saying that if God is a God of love, surely he's not going to send everybody to hell. We know he doesn't send anybody to hell. They make their own choice about that. God even says that he prepared hell as a place of containment uh, for the devil and his angels. It was never made for man. And yet the first people that will go there will be two men. Even before the devil goes there. How about that? The false prophet and the antichrist himself will first be cast into hell. But if God is this all loving God that never moves in judgment, how is it that he closed the chapter of all, on all of humanity when he brought the flood? And he stifled the life of every living creature on earth except those that he contained in the ark. Noah's ark to start again. If God was a God of such love that he would never bring judgment, why is it that you can go to the site of Sodom and Gomorrah today and you will find evidence of destruction such as there never was before or has been since. 
And it was so, here's the thing about it, this is true. If you go to Sodom and Gomorrah, you will find out that when that fire fell out of heaven, it was, it was so targeted. It was so surgical. It was like God lined up a missile on the cross hairlines of Sodom and Gomorrah. It didn't take out the general area around. It took out those cities. And when that fire fell, let me tell you, millions of degrees of heat, people were cooked where they stood. The whole of the city of Sodom fell. Not to this day. Not to this day. It's actually amazing. It's the only place where, where the, the people who work with that, I don't know what you call them, archaeologists work with that kind of phenomenon. They find things in Sodom and Gomorrah that they cannot find anywhere else. They find, they find evidence of burning and destruction by fire that they cannot find anywhere else in earth. Now, by that I mean you can even go to places like um, uh, the, the city that was destroyed by the volcano, by Vesuvius all those years ago. Pompeii, where, where lava ran through the streets and burnt people, was different. There is a different finding of, of, of what, what happened there as to what had, happened in Sodom and Gomorrah is unique. The fire that fell from heaven and brought destruction was a unique judgment of God on those cities. God is going to bring judgment over the nations. God is going to visit wicked governments after he's given space and time for his people to come out. After he's given space and time for change, the devil is given so much rope to hang himself with. The white horse. Who is this white horse? Who is the white horseman? As we unveil and reveal in scripture, God wants us to know what's coming and the information for the church to act on. He, he wants us to understand what's coming and, and hear this, that scripture will allow us to see that when we see Russia, the king of the north, and China, the king of the east, and Iran and the Islamic nations, the, the, uh, the kings of the south, all on the, the world stage at the one and the same time, know this, the time's at hand. We're living in those days. We're seeing a rounding up of what God is rounding up. We're seeing a playing out of end time events in our, in our own lives. The Antichrist is preparing to bring his one world order. One government one religion, one currency. I saw something this morning I shared with Vicky Ann. I said, wow, isn't that amazing? It's actually a counterfeit. With whatever else it is, it's a counterfeit of what happened on the day of Pentecost. Do you realize that? God brought in one place in the upper room one spirit that fell upon many that would produce one vision, one heart, one purpose, one mind. He's looking for that place of one government that ultimately he will bring. And the enemy is producing a counterfeit. He's pouring out his counterfeit spirit. He's pouring out his counterfeit plan. And he sends the white horseman, the deceiver. The one who will come cloaked in deception. The one who will come offering all kinds of things, but he's a liar. He's a deceiver. Amen. 
Revelations is a story. It's almost like a, if, you, if, if you could see this as you read it, and, and maybe we will at times, it's, it's, it's almost cinemato- what do you say? cinematography. It's almost like playing out on, on, the, on the big screen. A drama. Who likes a good drama where, where good prevails against evil? Can you think of many stories like that uh, where good actually prevails over evil in the end? Gives you the warm, fuzzy feeling. Do you go to the movies and watch that kind of a movie? I'm sort of struggling to think of the last one I saw. I don't see many movies, do I, dear? Not lately. Don't have time. But, you know, it's, it's not a horror story. It's actually a drama that if you, if, you allow, if you allow it to play out on the screen, we are seeing where ultimately God is going to prevail over the devil. Where good is going to prevail over evil. Where the church is going to rise triumphant into, into the full place of who she should be. Where we, where we overcome and we're seen to overcome sin and death and hell. Where the, church, uh, uh, where the church is going to rise eventually through the rapture to, 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 to return with the Lord and reign with Him. We, we are living in a time where through revelations we can see a good thing work out at the end. God bringing good out of evil. All things working for good. We will see Satan defeated. We will see Jesus as triumphant. We will see him return to rule. Uh, I came up with the new three R's. Who knows about the three R's? There's reading, writing, and arithmetic. (laughs) Uh, But we're going to rise, we're going to return, and we're going to rule with him. Amen? Amen? (laughs) Glory to God. (laughs) Hallelujah. We're, we're not going to be, uh, somebody said, we're not going to be running for office. In the new political game, I don't think it's going to be a political game. But uh, right now, we're preparing for what's going to happen in the United States. It doesn't look good. Um, and, in, and in this nation, if you want to stand in a place of government and contribute to our legislatures and our laws and, and have a voice, you need to run for election. You know what? We're not going to have to run for office when we return with the Lord. We're, that office is going to be ours. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is watching over all of this. He's watching over what is shaping in the Middle East. He's watching over this time where the white horseman is in play. Do you know I heard recently, and I think I said here, was it Perry Stone, just to name a name, um, on on one of his uh, itinerant whatevers, he was in the he was in 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 his hotel room preparing for the next meeting and God spoke to him and said very simply this I mean I'm just telling you this this is what he said I'm just relaying you what he said he said the spirit of God said something he'd never said to him before he said the man the spirit and the beast are all on the earth now I don't know at what age and at what stage your neighbor (laughs) We were waiting for the the one to be revealed. (laughs) Glory to God. Mm -hmm. But God has got his eye on on the world stage and the world scene and make no mistake that, 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 that God is working for the outcome and God is watching over Israel. And And there is no other nation, there is no other government, there is no other military leader that is going to decide the outcome 
for Israel. The Bible says that he who watches over Israel does not sleep nor does he slumber. And uh, I, I, I tell you this, he is causing those who even historically are enemies of Israel, he's causing those that he has a case with, those who have persecuted, those who have made a choice against Israel, those who have cursed his people in the past. He's putting a hook in Russia's jaw. He's putting a hook in, in the jaws of these nations that he's going to draw to this conflict. Some serious things happening in China and Russia on the world scene right at the moment. Did, 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 did you know? I didn't know except that Vicky Ann told me, because I don't even get to watch the news. But was it just in the last week or so or just in recent days that all the Russian diplomats around the world were recalled? All the Russian diplomats around the world everywhere have been called home. What does that mean in your mind? Close family. Tony? The close family members and everybody belonging to them. A anybody in, in a high government appointed place that is acting for Russia and representing Russia, whether it's in embassies, wherever, they have been recalled home. Something is going on. They are getting ready for something to happen. But God is going to determine the outcome for Israel. Amen. And he has done that. We have seen his hand move mightily and miraculously in the past, and he will do that again. God will decide the fate of Israel, not Russia, not China, not America, and certainly not any element of ISIS or Islam. Revelations. The book of Revelations and that story book of Revelations, that drama in Revelations, as it, as it unfolds uh, and, and the story plays out, will result in a thousand years of peace. Listen, a thousand years where there are no enemies. A thousand years where men have beaten their swords into plowshares. I mean, that was the language of the day. Uh, I guess they're going to turn nuclear armaments into, into what would you do with a nuclear armament? Turn, turn, ele pa power saw, electricity, building tools, mobile phones, smartphones. <laughs> something that's going to produce peace rather than conflict men are going to turn their implements of warfare into implements of peace into implements of family nurture and cultivation and, and we're going to have a thousand years without a devil we're going to have a thousand years of Jesus enthroned. We're going to have a thousand years of seeing the lamb as the lion. Wow. The kingdom of God is going to rule in the earth. Let me tell you the way God wanted it from the very beginning. Is it Revelations 21 and around verse 8. I don't know if we could bring that up. That tells us about the ungodly ones that will not participate in this kingdom. Oh, I've got to change it. Sorry. I'm saying bring it up. You can't, can you? Sorry. Source, where are you? Source. Neither the fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, 
whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars shall have their part in the lake of fire that burns. And we know that that lake is yet coming. But let me tell you, that kind of element is not going to be involved in this kind of government. And I've said this before, that this isn't just talking about a final place of damnation, but people who carry that kind of a nature will not participate in the kingdom of God. They will not participate in it here and now. They will not participate in it then. So, who is this rider on the white horse? He's the Antichrist. He's actually a man. He's not a beast. He's not a computer. We've heard all of those uh, rumours and those possibilities, calling him a, a computer or a, or a machine. He's not. He's not an organisation. He's a man. Daniel chapter 8 and 15 will tell us that. Uh, uh, Daniel 8 and 24 tells us that he is Satan's demonic Messiah. Some think that this picture is a, is a picture of Christ. He's not Jesus Christ. We understand that Jesus Christ ultimately will return on a white horse, on that white steed as the victor, and, 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 and he will come. We see that picture in, in this story of Revelation. It's revealed in, in uh, chapter 19 of Revelation. Uh, the differences between uh, Revelation 6 and uh, the crown that we see on this horseman is the Stephanos, looking at the Greek word. Stepho, by the way. Stephanos comes from a Greek word, Stepho, which means to, to wreathe or to, or to twine in, in the way that you would make. So a Stephanos is actually that wreathed or that woven crown, um, which, sorry? Wow, the crown of thorns, how about that? But uh, like Julius Caesar wore, it, so it would be something of the crown that, like that as a general or an emperor would have a victory. Um, um, it certainly was used as the Stephanos, the, 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 the crown that believers should receive in, in a way that a, uh, uh, an athlete would, that would win his race and win his course, that, that, that he would be recognized with a with the Stephanos. And there are many crowns like that, the Stephanos. But the, the crown that is worn by the rider on the white horse in Revelations is the diadema. It is the crown that is worn by the ruling king, the king of kings. There is only one crown like that, and there is only one Lord, and there is only one Jesus that will come wearing that crown. And that's our Lord. Amen. Another difference between that writer uh, of Revelation 6 is that he carries a bow, uh, and, and, uh, whereas in Revelation 19, that writer carries a sword. And of course, the bow can be that thing that can just fire attacks. That can be the fiery darts of the enemy. That can be accusation. It can be the, the, the attacks that come from the one that will come uh, Veiling his true identity, covering his true purpose, and coming in deception instead. The writer in Revelation 6 is the son of Satan, the chief son of Satan. That's who the son of perdition is. He's the chief son of Satan, the one who will stand. Uh, as the, and represent the Antichrist spirit during that time, that son of perdition. He comes promising world peace and deliverance, but what he will bring is global destruction. He will deliver, instead of peace, he will deliver a global bloodbath. Listen, men at this time are, are listening to the wrong voice. They're listening to the wrong spirit. They're tuned in to the wrong frequency. And that's why, as we understand in Revelations, this final church in the final hour needs to rise to the occasion. I, for one, am not one who believes 
for one moment that the church is going to be caught up in this great tribulation. Uh, and that's not the subject of teaching today. We're going to be taken out of it, but we need to shine before that moment. We need to be able to show the way before that moment. We need to be the five wise virgins that are so full of the Spirit of God that, that, that people will see and hear and understand what is going to be unfolding in these last days on this final stage as these four horsemen play out their final course. Do you know what? We talked about God being a God of judgment earlier. He is a God who certainly sets boundaries. And as we obey those boundaries, he releases his blessing. It's when instead of obeying that we disobey that ultimately judgment will be released. You know, even in the garden, had Adam and Eve obeyed, there was a tree of life that was planted in the midst of the garden. Still promised to us the result of obedience, the reward for obedience is life. The result and the reward and the consequence for disobedience is death and destruction. Just a little thought. I'm not going to go aside on this today. But I want you to see this. Disobedience comes first. And opens the door to every other vile act. And every other vile spirit. Think about this. The, the chicken and the egg. What came first? Defiance or disobedience? What came first? Rebellion or disobedience? <coughs> disobedience. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. It's a downward progression. Yeah. Obedience begins a downward progression that opens the door to all other kinds of of behavior and all other kinds of spirit and all other kinds of death and destruction. Obedience brings life. That life is coming for the church. Ultimate death and destruction is coming for the world. The spirit of the white horse being deception has actually been around for a long time. We know that deception has been around since the Garden of Eden. We know that the spirit of this horse, if we believe what seems to be the chronology, this, this white horse has been released some, some 2,000 years ago and is now the Antichrist coming to, to, to play out the final notes of the symphony, the final act of the show, the final outworkings of the release of that spirit. Examples and consequence I don't have the time to go into right now. I'll give you one. Samson was disobedient and he fell with Delilah and he finished up having his eyes poked out with hot irons and he served the rest of his days grinding corn. There is a consequence for falling under deception. Today's deception uh, leads to things like America signing the nuclear deal with Iran that it did lately. And this deal is a deal with the devil. This deal is supposedly brokered as a peace deal for America. Let me ask you this question. 
How can you make a deal with the devil and expect him to honor it? How can you believe for one moment that you will sign a treaty with your sworn enemy who's sworn to destroy Israel, who's sworn to destroy America, who's sworn to destroy Christianity? How can you sign a deal with that person believing that they, they've got any, any intention of keeping it at all? What that deal will do is not bring peace. It actually assures war. Um, it, it's against Israel. Can I just say this? We may, and I don't have time to cover off on it today. I'm going to stop shortly because I do want to pray. Um, we're obviously going to have to come back to this. There's a lot more to say about this subject, I tell you. But I'm going to finish with this. I was going to start on the 12 attributes of the Antichrist, which, which um, will show him firstly as, as being uh, the one who comes on, on the back of global economic recession and collapse. That's how he gets in. Uh, he will come offering peace, but he's going to bring war. Can I just say this about the Iran deal and we're going to close? Um, America, Obama, not only has signed off on this supposedly so that Iran will not aim weapons at America, but he's gone and given them $150 billion to assist them to create weapons that will ultimately they'll turn around and they'll first seek to use them. On, they're always going to be available against America, let me tell you. But they have written this, they have written this little bit of something into the deal that just, just, just to protect Iran, that if, that if anybody takes a preemptive strike on Iran, that the, the, the global community that are part of this are free to act on them. Now, this is, here, here's the picture. Can I say this quickly? Who do you think is going to want to take a preemptive strike on Iran? Number one, Israel. Because Iran is sworn to the destruction of Israel. The moment that Israel moves to take any preemptive strike, you'll have Russia and China and the whole lot of them begin to move on Israel. Can you see God bringing things together? Can you see the picture shaping? We have to stop there because we're out of time. There is much, 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 much more to say. This was all about bringing an understanding, a relevance of what revelations and these seals mean for us today. Are we getting there? we are so come back next week we'll finish with the white horse and we will go on with maybe we'll go on with the red horse next week we'll see